Um, I'll say this is my fourth No Time to Wait. The, I've been to three in person, and last year I um, uh, participated remotely, which was great, so I'll say hi to everybody on the live stream. Um, and I'm not sure if folks can see me because I'm short. But um, So uh, I'm thrilled to be here today, um, and I'm going to be talking about a uh, project um, about significant properties for digital video. And Kieran and I did not plan this, but Kieran mentioned significant properties. I don't see Kieran in the audience now, but um, there he is. Uh, and so um, Fadji has been working on a project. So here are the links I'm going to be talking about today. I'm not sure what the internet is here today, so I've got some screenshots. Um, you can find everything at the FADGI website, which is digitizationguidelines.gov, or try those. Um, so first, a couple of things about FADGI. So um, my standard FADGI joke is that it's a terrible acronym, right, but for good people doing great work. And it stands for um, the Federal Agencies Digital Guidelines Initiative. This is the U.S. Federal Agencies. Uh, we have two working groups, one for still images, and if anyone is involved with uh, still image digitization, you're likely familiar with the FADGI star ratings. Uh, and the other one is, um, and that group is led by my colleague uh, Tom Rieger. And um, the other one is the audiovisual working group, which I lead, and we cover audiovisual materials, right? Audio, um, video, and motion picture film. Some of you may know us um, from some of our big projects. We uh, did a couple years ago a comparison of file formats for, um, and, uh, for digital video, or reformatted video, I should say. Um, we recently published uh, an MXF application specification through SMPD called RDD48, and I will say that that publication is the only SMPD publication that's ever been published with a Creative Commons license, so it's freely available um, on the FADGI website. Uh, we ha have done some guidelines for digitizing motion picture film, and we have a new open source uh, tool out called Embark, which uh, embeds metadata into DPX files and does some conformance checking, and uh, we're expanding that to other formats as well. Um, I will say that all of the projects that uh, FADGI does, all of the open source tools, uh, all of our tools are, are open source, including we have one for still images called um, uh, Open Dice, which has now um, been made uh, open source, but um, all of our software is open source, and all of our publications have a Creative Commons license since December 2016, um, so you're free to use any of our information. Um, FADGI uh, is 20 U.S. federal agencies. Most of them are in the cultural heritage community, so we have a lot of folks from the U.S. Library of Congress and the National Archives, also Smithsonian. We have got a couple of FADGI members, uh, active FADGI members, uh, here in the audience today. But we also have Voice of America and folks like uh, NOAA, which is our weather um, agency and NASA, which is the space agency, and they are very interested, NASA especially, is very interested in the work that we've done um, with DPX. Um, and I'll just give a little bit of a shout out. Um, one of the better known FADGI projects uh, is uh, support for BWF meta edit. So, uh, and Dave talked about his love for the broadcast wave file earlier, so I can attest to this. But um, FADGI provided the, developed the guidelines for embedding metadata into the BEX chunk um, FADGI uh, related guidelines for embedding metadata, and then we provided the initial support for the development of BWF Meta Edit, and that first happened through um, AVP and Jerome and Dave bo both worked on that, but uh, a little bit of the, I guess, no time to wait effect is that two years ago in Vienna, I remember a conversation with Dave and Jerome in the lobby of the Film Institute there, and I said, well, we need to do some work to um, uh, improved BDF, BWF meta edit. Jerome had been doing that on a volunteer basis, so just two short years later, um, and that is sarcastic, right? Um, we uh, finally got some funding to do, um, uh, uh, we'll be doing some uh, bug fixes and some uh, feature enhancement, and uh, we'll make more announcements about this later, but if you wanted to contribute to that, please uh, do so um, through this link. So um, finally, uh, let, let's talk about what we're here to talk about. So the FADGI group was really inspired by uh, some work that came out of the National Archives of the Netherlands, and they put some documentation out at IPRES in 2018, rather, and again in 2019, about significant properties. And in my mind, significant properties kind of ebbs and flows, right? Sometimes it's quite popular, and sometimes it falls out of favor. But I was really impressed by this work that they did. And their definition of significant properties is about 
uh, information types that preservation practitioners consider significant in most contexts. It doesn't mean it has to stay the same, but just the information type is significant and something you want to pay attention to. Uh, and this differs a little bit from the initial report that was put out by JISC in 20, uh, 2008, um, where they're talking about um, the features that need to be preserved through those changes. So that's a little bit of a, of a different definition there. So the FAGI group met after the last IPRES in 2018. And I thought, you know, this is some great starter work that the National Archives of the Netherlands has put out, but maybe we can do a bit of a deeper dive. So a bunch of us started to work from last March through um, July, and uh, we um, put out a draft form, which you can find at that link, and it's still super drafty, and I'll talk about that in a second, but that's okay. Um, but this is the list of the significant properties that the came out from the National Archives of the Netherlands. And um, just I'll walk you through this spreadsheet a little bit. It's part of a, it's an extract of a much longer spreadsheet that's got all different content types in it. And this is just the bit for video. Um, and so there, the second column there is mapping to the significant properties from the GISC report. They've got a list of characteristics. That bit with the numbers over there are mapping to other um, projects that have looked at significant properties. And that includes the um, uh, Art and Humanities Data Service, Archivematica, Archivematica, sorry, the GISC report, and a couple others. And that final column over there is how important are these things. And so we took a look at this and we thought, you know, um, that's quite helpful, but what is missing from this list, right? Is this list the list that we want? But also, what are the content, context rather, of these different data points? So, you know, wh what does this mean when you're, when, when you're talking about um, image streams, for example, and I'll, and I'll go to depth a little bit that in a minute. So the FAGI project says, all right, so what, what are the technical characteristics that we want to look at specifically in the GLAM section, not necessarily in broadcast, but in uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, and, and what ways can those properties be changed, but also what's the impact of change on those various properties? So um, there's also a completely selfish tie-in, as I say there, <laughs> to a project that I did in 2014 from FAGI called Creating and Archiving Born Digital Video. Um, and that has some high-level recommendations in there. But that, it's about five years since that has happened now, and it could certainly uh, use an update. But I do think that there's some good information in there uh, that we can pull from. So, ah, sorry. Um, so, this, this FSPDV is uh, arguably a worse acronym than FAGI, but only, only uh, marginally uh, so. So um, when these are the data points that we actually came up with, and there's a couple of slides of these. And the ones that are in um, italics are ones that we haven't really come across in other significant properties products projects, rather. So we sort of define it by the class of certificate properties from the original GISC report. Um, we have two levels of definition. One is an in-depth technical definition, and one is um, something for a, a layperson. And our, the, our audience for this project is really sort of beginner to mid-level practitioners. We're not talking about uh, engineers here. Um, and then we've got lots of references in there. And uh, for me, one of the most important parts of this is typical values. What do you expect to see in a field that's talking about chroma sampling, for example? Um, and then we'll talk a little about the impact of change. Um, I've got the map to the high-level recommended practices. I'm not sure why those things are blue, because I don't think they were blue earlier, but it doesn't matter. The blue means nothing. Um, and then how is this data represented in some various open source tools? So if you're looking at you know, what, what, what tags can you expect to see this data in? So these are what we have come up with and that we think is arguably significant. And I, I should say, this is certainly a collaborative project. We are. I, you know, when I put this abstract in, I thought, surely we'll be finished, because we had wanted to present this at IPRES 2019. We did not present it at IPRES 2019, because it's, uh, we just haven't gotten a chance to sort of finalize it yet. But these are what we think are significant at this point. Um, the stuff in orange is uh, something that we have seen in other significant properties projects, but we have augmented that description in some way. And we'll see yellow in some uh, additional slides. Um, that's something that we have not typically seen. So uh, one thing that sort of surprised me 
was that you do see associated metadata in uh, other projects. And to me, um, I'll put my MXF hat on, and that's something that we saw a lot in RDD 48. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how to describe color, and I would say we have not yet done that perfectly in the FAGI documents, but we're sort of getting there. Um, chroma sampling, there's a lot of information that you see about the encoding, but uh, much to my surprise, not so much about the wrapper. Time code, if you're into that, um, captions and subtitles, and there's a couple more that we're thinking of, but we haven't necessarily decided if they should be in there or not. Um, and this is probably can't see it, but this is just a, a screenshot of, you imagine this is one long thing there going across. Um, and so this particular one is about image size. And uh, there's lots of different ways that people have described image size in the um, significant, significant properties. They had image height and image width. And we just decided to combine them in, so that we could also um, make some mention of some rev, uh, resolution there. So you see we have our technical definition and then our layperson one. Um, some of this is the handiest thing, I think, like what, what is a typical value in, that you would see there for an NTSC um, or even a computer screen one? And what's the impact of change on that property if it's, uh, if you're looking at it in two different files and they're, they're not agreeing? You know, what, what's happening there? Um, we also have links to some relevant standards where you might find um, this information and, and, and where did we get our definitions from? Um, the map to the high level um, recommended practices, our earlier FAGI project. Um, and these are the fields in which you would find that data in Media Info or, MF, or FF Probe or, or um, Exif Tool. Some folks um, uh, like Exif Tool, so um, we put that in there. Um, so this is an example of the Chroma summary one, and uh, pardon me, sam uh, sampling one. And uh, I think back to when I was first starting many years ago, and you know, if you see 422 somewhere, you know, what, what exactly does that mean? So this is a bit more in-depth technical, so we'll talk about a little bit of the difference between YCBCR or YUV, um, but then there's also the summary definitions. It says, you know, this is when you're converting, this is what this means. That's the color channel separation there. Um, Video tracks or channels is described in the National Archives of the Netherlands as, I think it's, uh, is it image streams? So we decided to parse that out a little bit. And uh, in our larger workbook, we have several pages, which I'll go through in a minute, but one of them, it gives an opportunity to provide some more information. So it, 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 a track, a channel, a stream, they all are kind of used interchangeably, but there is a little bit of a difference there, so we wanted to provide, for those who want a little bit more information, an opportunity to get that. So there's a link to this sort of second page, which talks about um, some of the differences between those things. So we wanted to, you know, you want to summarize to an extent, but you also want to provide um, an, enough information. Um, and we spent almost an entire hour-long session talking about duration. So you'd think duration just means it's the runtime of the video, right? But alas, um, it means maybe some more different things there. So uh, we, for those of people who are just, you know, for what duration means is it is the runtime and it's in ISO 8601, you know, that's fine. But then an engineer got in the room and they provided all of that information that no one wants to read, right? But it does talk about some of the more in-depth information about time code and drop frame and some of this other stuff. So if you want to go deeper, if you need to go deeper, um, that information is then available. So um, this is the tabs that we have um, available now. So the draft is the summary one in my vision. Um, and I would, would joke in our meetings that I would die on this hill, right? It, I want it to be like a one-page poster that you can put up on your wall. Um, I don't know that that's ever going to come to be, but um, it, it would be a one-page poster. Um, and then we have a second column, a second page that goes in to provide some of that more in-depth information. We have uh, a resources and references list. Where are we getting all of our definitions? What are the standards that you should be looking at? And then the final page is about uh, what we did early on, which was mapping significant properties projects um, across one another. And it's a little bit incomplete, so I wouldn't go by that necessarily. I think I gave up at a certain point. But um, it is kind of helpful to see the, you know, what people think is significant and what FAG you might think is significant. Um, so yeah, well, de detailed key 
frames and concepts and references and lots of other stuff. Um, Peter contacted me earlier this week, last week, um, and said uh, that he's interested in the project and that we are, you know, can he, could he comment on it? And the answer is yes, of course. We would love to have comments on it. Um, comments are always welcome in Fadgie land. Um, uh, just a couple of shout outs to some folks uh, who worked on this project with us. A couple of folks uh, are in the room, including Julia and, um, and Blake and potentially some other folks. Um, so just want to acknowledge the good work that everyone here has done. So um, this is the references from this talk, but the much longer list of references is available uh, on the FADGI spreadsheet. And before um, I go away, I want to give a shout out to um, some work that's happening in YASA. So many of you may be available, may be aware of uh, YASA TC06, which was uh, guidelines for reformatted video, and that work was led by Carl Fleischauer, and it's published and freely available on the YASA site. And there was always a thought that we would do a complementary one on born digital video, but we decided to make that into a new document. So instead of having TC06 go on forever, that it would now become TC07. And this work is going to be led by um, the amazing Samaya Langley, and she is looking for help. So the thought here is that it would be a much more um, a sort of an open and collaborative effort that you could just write about the little bit that you know and don't have to be intimidated by trying to provide an enormous amount of information. And if you're interested in learning how to participate, Lars Galstad has some handouts. So Lars, can you wave to folks in the back? There's Lars. He's the head of our technical committee um, in YASA. Oh, sorry. Alessandra has the handouts there. Oh, that's from Lars. Anyway, someone has handouts. So um, if you're interested, um, please contact them um, or give uh, Samaya a shout on Twitter or um, that's the email, borndigitalvideo at gmail.com. And I think that's it. Did I talk really fast? You did, but that was fine. Oh, there's, sorry. there's plenty of time for questions, <laughs> which I know everyone has lots of questions. <laughs> Julia, yes. Not you, but it's from Brett. If file format or container is a significant property and significant properties are supposed to stay unaltered forever, then this implicitly means that no transcoding or wrapping should ever be done. Where is the bug in my reasoning? So we are using the term significant property in a little bit of a different way. I don't believe that a significant property has to remain unchanged forever. I think a significant property is something, is a technical characteristic that you should be aware of. And if there is change, what is the impact of that change? So Peter had a similar question to me earlier this week. And I think Fadji's interpretation of that is, uh, is, is used in a bit of a different way. So I don't know if Breck needs to reply. He certainly can. Yes. Um, I have a remark among your significant properties. There was audio bit depth, if I read that correctly. Yeah, no, here, no. W once again, yeah, oh, here, yeah, yeah. audio Sorry. bit depth. Um, for most audio files and for everything in broadcast, this property does not exist. Uh, we may have, have, we could have a mistake there. And the issue is here that most people believe that such a property exists. I know that because we regularly get such bug reports. Uh, the bit depth is by FF, presented by FF Probe is wrong. Uh, but the problem is there is no right or wrong bit depth because of the technical base how audio is encoded. Uh. Well, um, I was going to look up to see what we said, but uh, I would say let's chat later uh, and, and see what, what, the, what we have in our sheets. Yes. But it, I, again, the comments are super welcome, and you know, if we have a mistake, we'll happily fix it. But also, if, we'll have to see what our content is, our context is, rather. When I read it, I thought to myself that audio sampling rate, in, in contrary, is an important property. And then I realized that Opus, which is a new audio codec that is considered the best uh, uh, what, I'm sorry, what was that codec? I, I didn't hear it. OPUS. Oh, OPUS, okay. So it is considered of quality-wise being the best codec, and it does not strongly support the concept of sampling rates. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm just stating this because I, I agree that these are significant uh, properties, but some of these do not always exist. 
think that's okay. If, if they don't exist in whatever the codec is, then they don't exist. Uh, no, nothing is required in this way. Um, I, w if, if they exist in the file, then we're interested in knowing about them. Yes, we have another question here. Hi, Kate. I think this is really fantastic work, and I look forward to contributing in some way. Um, my question is, is this going to align in any way with um, the capability that uh, premise, the preservation metadata implementation strategies has for documenting these significant properties, because they have a whole set of elements about where you can manually define the significant properties that you want to preserve over time. Premise makes me tired. Um, I, I mean, I, I think all of these things interact, right? And we didn't necessarily look at, look at premise when we started this work, but uh, I, I, I assume that there's some mapping and you could integrate uh, this into premise in some way. But uh, the Library of Congress is the host of Premise. We don't implement Premise even in our own institution because it's it's a complicated structure. So, but yeah, um, I said Premise makes me tired. But I'm I'm a fan of Premise. But um, yeah. Are there any other questions? And quick note: um, when you do ask a question, please stand up and state your name. It's a new new rule. <laughs> Yes, oh, we do sorry. have one. Yeah, hi, my name is Alex from the British uh, Archives. I just wanted to make a comment regarding the audio bit depth and the sampling rate. <clears throat> In, at the British Archives, we consider those two things extremely important. We normally use 24 bits, 48 kilohertz sampling rate. That's what we use. Extremely important. We were on 16 bit, the CD format but we decided to go to 24-bit. OK. Let's not have an argument about <laughs> that. We'll just, Kate will answer all questions about that later. Um, thanks, Kate. Thank you. <laughs>